Okay, hello everyone. I'm Naomi. I'm from the Gastivist Collective and Kiel is here as well. Um, not visible on video, but so you know who, who you're speaking to. Here he is. Hi everyone. Kiel Kruni from Germany. Nice to be with everyone today. Um, so we are from the Gastivist Collective. We are an international group that facilitates the flow of information from grassroots groups um, to NGOs and the other way around who are working on gas and fighting new gas infrastructure. Um, so in the presentation today, we will be talking a bit about the impacts of gas on climate and on communities, a bit about the gas industry's plans to rapidly um, globalize um, the gas network, um, a bit about how these projects are funding and then about the resistance against gas. So the industry is selling gas as a cleaner, greener solution um, to oil and coal. Um, here we can see some examples of greenwashing. Just the fact that we call it natural gas is thanks to industry lobby groups. And so instead of natural gas, we call it fossil gas because it is just another fossil fuel. And I will talk a little bit about uh, fossil gas and climate change. And if you go to the next slide, um, uh, I would like to start first with the numbers because uh, many people uh, still uh, keep repeating uh, a very outdated number, which is um, the number of 21, like um, fossil gas, which is uh, basically methane, uh, would be 21 times as potent as CO2 in warming the planet. And that is a very uh, old number, uh, um, IPCC report from uh, 1996. And um, this is assuming uh, an equivalency one year. Actually, it only stays in the atmosphere for 12 years. And in those 12 years, it is more than 100 times as potent as CO2 in warming the planet. And this means by using the 21 figure, we are underestimating the impact of, uh, of methane on the climate, the contribution of methane to global warming as we observe it right now by a factor of five. And here on the slide, you can see some of the older numbers um, from the different uh, IPCC reports. Uh, this 100-year uh, number has been revised upwards. And if you uh, do it over... 20 year time period are much higher. Um, if we go to the next slide, you can see we, um, when accounting for methane on a 20 year time scale, um, you get a very different picture um, of um, how much uh, different energy sources are contributing to climate change and even um, conventional gas, gas is uh, having a higher content than coal um, when using that perspective. And uh, um, we, we, we argue that uh, it is necessary to uh, um, take the short-term perspective because climate change is happening already. The impacts are already very visible and uh, you can't really uh, water down that impact and say, well, we will uh, edit Time period where the methane will not there, but make an impacts are already happening right. On the next slide, you can see that the contribution of, of methane uh, um, as much as more than half as much than. Okay, my internet is slow. I will be speaking more slowly. Um, can I have the next slide, please? There you go. So you can see here in the previous slide, <laughs> before about the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, you can see how much methane is actually contributing to warming that we, we are observing now. And it's more than half, half as much as many people are not aware of that. Uh, going to the next slide in the United States, where a shift a switch from coal to fracked gas has taken place in the electricity sector 
if you account for uh, this, the methane emissions associated with uh, um, fracking and gas extraction, uh, then actually CO2 emissions have gone up in the United States since 2005 and not as the uh, traditional accounting implies. Um, on the next slide, we will see uh, a systems perspective um, of the global climate planet Earth and we are um, rapidly going towards a, a situation which is called hothouse Earth here in this um, slide in this publication and uh, the, there is a possibility to stabilize Earth you can see that the left stabilized Earth to stabilize our planet in a uh, that would maintain it in a livable uh, condition. But uh, what methane does, it is uh, pushing our planet very quickly towards or maybe even beyond that planetary threshold uh, um, after which um, this runaway uh, dynamic becomes very strong. Um, so this is a little bit about the dynamic of methane and uh, fossil gas in the globe climate system as um, in the next slide uh, shown charted the uh, lifetime of an EBS pipeline against the need to decarbonize the global economy uh, to meet the Paris Agreement's climate targets and it is very clear that this um, uh, a new land or built now uh, would have to be shut down before the end of its useful life in order to um, stay in line with the uh, Paris commitments to 1.5 or 2 degrees. Um, but climate is not the only um, reason why uh, fossil gas is bad. There are also other negative impacts on communities and we have just listed a few of you through next slide so when you start drilling you start uh, uh, oh, you know, it's cutting out a bit uh, the ground thing was uh from around earthquake okay so maybe just to start again on the local impacts okay so when you start drilling the ground you start polluting not only beer with methane but also the groundwater and uh, when you pump out um, things from under the ground you often cause earthquakes this is especially notorious with fracking but also conventional gas earthquakes um, such as in think mud Indonesia uh, which you are now very close uh, to and um, those are very heavy impacts on local communities um, explosions are also a thing that happens every year uh, in the gas supply chain and um, conflict uh, is, is uh, present in many places around the world often uh, environmental defenders uh, get criminalized and there is repression uh, by the government and security forces uh, since uh, uh, criminalized uh, dissent is uh, people are thrown into jail and uh, generally there are many many countries where uh, uh, dictators or repressive governments are uh, strengthened with the income from gas so that is also a thing to keep in mind that uh, uh, undemocratic regimes uh, are often being strengthened um, as is from uh, Azerbaijan or and with this over to Wait, Naomi who will talk you uh, through uh, the global situation of what the gas industry uh, looks like and how active at the moment 
Thank you. So the last, it cut out when you were just giving another example, you said Azerbaijan, and I think another example of a repressive regime profiting from gas. Yeah, that, that was Algeria. Uh, Algeria as well. Okay. Okay, so the, the gas industry used to be quite domestic and um, and now, in the last decades, we see a big um, push to, to globalize, um, to make the gas industry international. And also, since the 80s, we've seen a boom in fracking. It's relatively new technology. Fracking is unconventional gas extraction in which um, the, the land is fractured and uh, water with chemicals is pumped into it. It's more complex than this, but this is a relatively new technology that has been booming in the US, and now they are trying to export this technology. So now I will give a bit of a global overview. Um, here we can see a map, a uh, graph of gas extraction um, in, the diff in different regions. We can see here that um, in, since 1995, it's been increase, increasing quite rapidly in North America, in America, and has been in Asia, in gas extraction. And in gas consumption, Oh, sorry. Again, increase in North America. Generally, an increase in um, increases everywhere in every continent in every region. Um, and the most rapid increase from 1995 to 2015 is in Asia Pacific. Here we can see the liquefaction facility capacity. Um, this means the facilities to liquefy gas in order to ship it. Because um, there are two ways of transporting gas, either in pipelines or by cooling it down to, until it's liquid and um, putting it in ships to go around the world. And here we can see Qatar has by far the most liquefaction capacity. Indonesia um, at second and Australia and the US are massively investing in new liquefaction capacity because they want to send, the, to send gas um, around the world by ship. And here we can see the regasification facility who is buying this liquefied gas um, and turning it back into its gaseous form. And Japan um, has by far the most and China is investing quite some money in it. Yeah, um, right now uh, lots of new projects are being planned or are being built and the uh, recurring theme is a very uh, thick uh, projection of future uh, gas demand and gas consumption. And um, here we have an example from the EU where that is also taking place in spite of uh, EU gas demand uh, being, uh, if not stable, going down over the past years. And obviously the climate targets um, mean that we have to be uh, phasing out gas as well as fossil fuels uh, very quickly. So this... Uh, um, projections of gas demand are coming from the industry and they say, okay, we, we will be using much more gas in the future. That's why we need new infra infrastructure. Um, but it, it doesn't uh, go well together with reality. In the next slide, we have uh, uh, some figures on uh, how much of this uh, capacity is actually used here from the European picture for uh, regasification of liquefied natural liquefied fossil gas and um, these uh, um, installations are only used on average about 20 percent and still a lot of new um, facilities are being proposed and this means that the market isn't actually there and they need uh, uh, 
uh, subsidies of money to be able to build these things. The next one. Um, so uh, one of the um, uh, banks to look for funding is the World Bank. And they have said because of the Paris Agreement, we will not finance upstream oil and gas anymore. But this is only, and that was uh, last December at the One Planet Summit in Paris. And um, But this is only uh, referring to exploration and extraction of oil and gas, but not pipelines and uh, downstream. Um, so um, there's a lot of infrastructure that the World Bank still says it, it would uh, be happy to finance. And the other multilateral development banks are actually lagging behind. So the European Investment Bank, the EBRD, the AIIB and so on, uh, they still haven't committed to ending uh, any oil and gas finance. And so there's a big need for us to push for that, uh, for uh, public money to be compliant with the Paris Agreement and not finance new uh, fossil infrastructure. And uh, here's some a report from the colleagues of um, Bankwatch that are showing how much public money is still flowing into a, a fossil, new, new fossil, such as the S corridor bringing Azerbaijan into Europe and which is uh, resisted by communities along the way and in Azerbaijan uh, the opposition uh, some of uh, which is in, in prison have said that this is stabilizing the regime uh, stabilizing the regime um, so we'll we'll go uh, other examples of the resistance to gas and let Naomi uh, talk you through that <clears throat> so, as the industry plans to massively globalize and imposes this new infrastructure, lots of local groups are resisting. Um, as well as local groups, there are quite some uh, people in NGOs working against gas, um, working on policy, um, investigating the funding that goes into new gas infrastructure, um, lobbying, uh, networking, providing platforms for local groups and uh, sharing information. And so local groups are resisting gas at many points at the supply chains. There are groups um, uh, blocking and taking action at extraction sites, in transportation um, infrastructure such as LNG terminals and pipelines, and also local groups um, targeting the banks and the politicians that support um, the dash for gas. So this is an image from Code Roads um, action in the Netherlands last August. Um, Code Roads are a Dutch climate justice mobilization group and they organized a blockade of gas infrastructure of uh, a storage facility for gas condensate, a byproduct of um, the gas extracted for fuel. And about 700 people uh, blockaded this uh, massive site for two days. Um, another example is in the UK. Here you can see also blocking infrastructure. Um, people are very creative with how they take action at the sites to stop um, to stop vehicles bringing toxic chemicals in and out of the site and equipment and things like this. So in this image, you can see um, some lorry surfers, people surfing, climbing on top of a on top of a vehicle carrying a lot of equipment for fracking, and um, holding it there. So people held these vehicles could not move for three or four days, shutting down operations at the site. And just a few, a week or two ago, um, three people, four people in fact, were sent to prison for uh, 15 and 16 months for climbing on top of a lorry and stopping operations at this site. Because um, fracking is being ruthlessly pushed ahead in the UK. So these are some examples of actions at extraction sites. Here we see um, people resisting the TAP pipeline in Italy 
the tap pipeline, the tap is the Trans Adriatic Pipeline, and it's one section, the last section of the Southern Gas Corridor that Kia was talking about, um, which is intended to bring gas from Azerbaijan all the way through Europe to Italy. So here we can see people from the No Tap movement. Here we can see the resistance against the Midcat pipeline in Spain um, with some creative storytelling here on the left, using a scroll to, um, to explain to people what is happening um, with gas and the pipeline and the resistance there. Here is a group called Fossil Gas Fallen fighting a new LNG terminal in Sweden um, on their kayaks in the water. And here is a group on the right um, resisting a new pipeline in Mexico. And on the left, um, a group of people interrupting the speech just after interrupting um, a speech of someone from the European Investment Bank discussing their sustainable investment when in fact funding the TAP pipeline. So actions against gas are happening at many points, many points in the supply chain. And on the 13th of October, this Saturday, and on the few days before and after it, um, is the Gas Down Frack Down. It's an international mobilization against gas and lots of international groups, um, groups from uh, six continents, from uh, North America, South America, um, Africa, Asia, um, Oceania, are mobilizing, doing coordinated actions, um, and connecting their local fights internationally because our struggles are local, but we are connected and the fight is global. So um, keep an eye out and you can, you can look up these actions and find out more about uh, the different groups resisting um, by looking this up. Here we can see um, some of the actions plotted on a map. This is where people are taking action in mid-October. So we'd love for you to stay in touch with us, to join the movement, to connect your movement to this movement and to stay in touch. Um, to spread the word about fossil gas, to integrate it in your anti-fossil fuel messaging. You can find more resources if they will be helpful for you on this link. Um, we will share the slideshow um, on the Gastivist website. We collect, we collect resources and update it as more reports come out. Um, you can stay updated by signing up to the Gastivist newsletter where we share information about, um, about the resistance, what local groups are doing, and also what new reports and uh, information comes out that may be useful for local groups. You can also send us things to include in this newsletter. And there's also the Beyond Gas email list um, that keeps up with policy um, about gas and um, other organizing. Um, as I said, in mid-October, in uh, I guess next week and the week after, there'll be lots of actions and material coming out to Gas Down Frack Down, so you can share this and keep up with that. There are all sorts of things you can do to fight gas, and uh, some examples are organizing actions, community exchanges, um, organizing a speaker's tour for people resisting on the front lines, facilitating a network, maybe making a platform, but really we encourage to um, find whatever suits um, you and your communities. And we'd love to hear from you um, and connect and share and see how we can work together. So just send us an email at hello at gastivist.org. Uh, Kiel, is there anything you would add? No, just to say thank you for listening and uh, we hope to uh, maintain the interaction going so if there are some questions um, and the internet connection allows it we'll, we'll be happy to take them thanks for watching okay thank you very much bye